Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show, where ordinary heroes tell extraordinary stories during unique and never been heard before conversations with your host, Hillary Arno Burns. Hillary's unique listening and way of asking questions results in conversations that aren't usually talked about. So you can create the life that you really want, but are afraid you can't really have. We are demonstrating the greatness and the human spirit in creating a world where we all reclaim our birthright of joy, happiness, purpose, and passion. Now, here's your host, Hilary Arno Burns. Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show. And today we have a very special guest. You're going to love her. Her name is Nancy Chadwick. She's an author, writer, essayist, and wife. And I just finished reading her book. Her book is The Wisdom of the Willow. And I can't wait to talk to her about it. So welcome, Nancy. Hi, Hillary. Hi. It's great to see you. Oh, good to see you. All right. So I know you, well, you had a background before you started writing. Do you mind? I always like to know what people did before and how they got brave enough to start writing. So do you mind telling people about I, your background? No, I don't mind at all. Um, okay. I uh, When I finished school, I went into advertising. So I worked for uh, Leo Burnett Advertising Agency in Chicago. Um, and I currently live just in a northern suburb of Chicago. Um, and, and what did I, you study? What did you study in, in college? Journalism. I was in the College of Journalism. And that's that's my degree. And in order to kind of go into advertising, I needed to study in the College of Journalism to get that degree. Okay. So um, I was at Leo Burnett and I wanted to get into uh, account management. I wanted to... Um, uh, tell little mini stories to sell products and services for, for clients. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't get there in a large agency. So um, I kind of agency hopped and went to a couple other smaller agencies, a PR firm, but I just couldn't get to where I wanted to be. Um, and that was in the eighties. It was very, uh, to get into account management was very male dominated. Um, so can I, um, like for me, and maybe I'm ignorant, but when I hear journalism, I think of like writing for papers or traveling, being a, you know, whatever, you know, a traveling person with a magazine or a newspaper or someone who just writes for a newspaper. Did, is that what you wanted to do or that was just a degree you had to get in order to write? Yes, that was the degree I needed to get. Um, okay. the, the sequence in the College of Journalism, ad, pardon me, advertising was in... Uh, the College of Journalism. So I had to take okay. all these courses and basically I have a, a, a journalism degree, but I have an advertising degree within that college. Oh, so, so that's where it fell into at Marquette University. So it's not like business, right? Normally I would think advertising and marketing would be in a business school, but this right, was, was right. This a, which, where did you go? Was it a liberal arts college? Um, it, it, it's a university, Marquette in Milwaukee. Oh, Marquette, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So did they have a business? Program? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but this it was not that. Okay, cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, all the, a lot of classes I took were a big overview, persuasive writing, editorial, um, but there was a whole um, uh, class schedule for advertising. So we did a lot of campaign work, some marketing um you know, so it it wasn't very specific. It was broad to get into that study of advertising. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. So that's why you went into marketing, because right. That's yeah. Why. So <laughs> so that's why I did the advertising thing. Okay. Um, with not, I had the the um, journalism kind of the writing part in the back burner, um, mm -hmm. but I I was really focused on advertising because I liked the visuals of it. I liked uh, the idea of selling uh, products um, and making up little mini stories in order to do that, where you you devise characters and and um, mm. uh, personalities like Tony the Tiger for 
um, cereal, so to make something memorable in order to sell it. Um, but I couldn't get to where I wanted to be. So okay. I, I left advertising and I kind of took those skills and worked for um, Bank of America in uh, international corporate banking. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, are um, you being facetious or no, did you actually, I'm, you actually I'm serious. Got to use, yeah. you got yeah, to use so, the skills at Bank of America? Wow. Yeah. So I was working um, in a um, in a kind of a newer department um, called foreign exchange, and it was basically cash management. So I was learning a new system um, for FX and, you know, and that's like a whole new um conversation that we can put on the side that would take right. a long time to get into. But um, so I transferred um, uh, over into the San Francisco office, um, which was head office at the time, um, to see if I could get into a marketing uh, program there. Um, and that didn't pan out. But what did pan out was I met my future husband in San Francisco. Oh. So um, whether it you know, not a coincidence. It was meant to be whatever for me to transfer out to San Francisco. Um, and I worked in cash management there for uh, large corporate and um, medium uh, sized companies. Um, and then. Um, so I, that was all because I used to work down on Wall Street and I know like that was all numbers, right? That in my mind, I'm just wondering where did the writing go undercover? Yes. At that point, because this is numbers, yeah, yeah. FX and all that is just. It was numbers. more of a of a selling position. Um, I, okay. I was selling a a system, a cash management system, to corporations. Um, oh. Um, but I, I I shouldn't say the I was Bank of America. Yes, there there was a sales force. I was actually kind of a an implementation manager. So oh, okay. I, I, um, you know, made all it happen. Once the sale happened, I, I, I made it all go. So, um, by the grace of God, it all worked out, but if it didn't, I was the first line of defense that they called to call me up. So, so they were selling the system that they obviously developed to other banks, I'm assuming. Um, yes. Or, yeah. And, and they used it in house as well. Okay. Yeah. So that's very different from writing. Okay. How did you end up getting that position with Bank of America? Um, I got it through me and and said, I boy, do I have a job opening? <laughs> and she and I said, Okay, you know, who what? And I said, Really? Um, a bank? No, you know, just just hear me out, hear me out. Um, you know, just go on the interview. And I really um, liked my my future boss, the people I would work with. Um, it was just kind of a smaller group at the time, based mm -hmm. in Toronto. Um, and uh, I, I said, why not? You know, I I just you know used all my skills for management and yeah. implementing projects. And um, yeah, good for you. So yeah, I so mean, I, I used that. to do system stuff, but it you know I'm just yeah. thinking of your journalism. That's definitely not. Not, you know, I was wondering if you somehow got to write in there, but you didn't. So, okay. No. Just put that on hold. No. But, yeah. yeah. I'm so sure think, it was challenging. I know systems implementations are very challenging. Yeah. I mean, it was, I was very hands-on too with yeah. clients as well. Yeah. So, and that's the best, the good part I liked about it as well. You yeah. know, the people part rather than the, you know, do I have all the documents and, you know, signed yeah. and yeah. all that. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So then you go to San Francisco, you meet your soon to be husband. Yeah. And then where? Yeah. And then I came back to Chicago um, after three years, still with the bank. Um, and um, at him? the time we got engaged okay. um, and he's from North Dakota um, and his mom was getting on in years. So um, it was a, a, a better commute if there was a commute from Chicago to, to North Dakota than San Francisco to North Dakota. So logistics wise, it all worked out. Yeah. And everything that we ended up. Um, so um, after we married, I, you know, I, I just was not happy still working at the bank. I, it was dry, not that the people were dry. I enjoyed the people, but the work and I, I was just missing the creative people mm -hmm. working with art directors and in coming up with you know solutions to things and 
my husband said, well, why don't you take the summer off? Take the summer off. We can swing it financially, you know, see what's next. So I took the summer off and I never went back to work. <laughs> and how long ago was that? So that was um, 27 years ago. 27. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And Good there was the birth of my writing. And I kept a journal for a while. And then I said, you know, in the process of trying to figure out, you know, where I was in my life, the next step, I just kind of wrote all of these experiences, things that happened all the way back to when I was a kid. And I thought, okay, now what do I do this? And I said, oh, I'm going to write a memoir. And that was the beginning of me studying the craft. What does that mean? It's not an autobiography. It's right. not a timeline of everything that I'm writing, who I saw, and you know. Um, and where did you study? You study? I studied books. I studied, um, uh, all self-studied. Um, okay. So yeah. No cor courses. No, or, no um, courses. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. Wow. Yeah. And um, so I, I wrote a first draft and um, knew it was too autobiography, hmm. but I started working with a developmental editor and got some critiques who helped me along the way, did some handholding. And from there, it really developed into a thematic memoir, which basically my under the birch tree um it's discovering connections and finding home so it all i all went back to my my first pivotal moment was when i was probably like seven or eight and i had a, a birch tree growing in my front yard and i noticed it one spring morning there were these little baby bunnies in a nest and kind of the curb underneath the tree mm. and my brother came said this is really cool he took them out put him in a box, a shoe box, and took him to show his friends. And I was traumatized. So that little micro story turned into um, finding our places in life, mm. um, making those connections. And how do we do that? For me, it was a birch tree, which became really synonymous with home. I loved the look of a birch tree. Um, it, it just all how it literally looked figuratively how it meant mm -hmm. um and um it just the the memoir evolved from there so that was my thread that every time i saw a birch tree wherever i would go whether it would be an adverse experience it would remind me of home and it, it would just kind of place me in a settling position where i would feel feel unsettled. Wow. So what, so, so when I did my memoir, it was like a few years, you know, what did you have a certain time frame of your life that it was? No, I, no. I, I, I kind of skipped. So I, I took those pivotal moments. So it would be, um, you know, the, the birch tree, um, you know, parents divorce, high school really coming of age oh gosh college um so there were specific mm. instances that i pulled um that fed my story of how i of the reflection and finding really my place to be where that is wow i gotta get that one next wow okay so you did the memoir and then you published it. Did you have a publisher and all that? Um, actually, I, I didn't. Um, however, the developmental editor that I was working with was working with She Writes Press. And she said, well, is it your intention to publish with She Writes Press? And I said, well, I, I thought this manuscript really has a little bit more of a ways to go. But mm -hmm. sure, you know, I'll, I would love to talk to them. So she introduced me to Brooke Warner, the publisher, and um, we got the, the manuscript all, all polished up and the rest was history. So I, I published with them and I couldn't have been more happy. I mean, it just everything from the cover is, to the pages. Wow. That yeah. is so great. When I was going to publish mine, what I was told was 
nobody wants to read about you. They only want to read about famous people. So right. no, so I ended up self-publishing and, you know, sure. I, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have, I had some people helping me with the writing, but I didn't have anybody to help me with the publishing and stuff. So I, I it took me seven years, but I figured out but how you to did do it. it. Right. Yeah, I did it. I didn't, you know. Yeah. And, well, and then, we, but yeah. Yeah. So good for you for getting a publisher. I mean, I'm sure, you know, they had more, more experience. Than I yeah. Had. Well, I think one of the thing that, um, as I look back on it, the reviews that came in were, um, my gosh, this is so relatable. What happened mm. to you happened to me. Mm. And, and that, and that experience carried me through the rest of my writing, whatever I was going to write, I wanted to make it relatable that people would identify with, mm. that they could, um, the characters I would create, that they could relate to those characters. They liked them or didn't like them. Mm -hmm. um, so the memoir was really a good stepping stone um, to writing uh, fiction and into writing essays and, and writing further. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, all right. I, I'm, I want to ask you about the book, but, but let's just go sequentially. Okay. So you wrote the memoir, you had it published and then what? I know you were writing essays during right. that time. Oh, and I was still writing, um, you know, some essays for um, Chicago Writers Association, other different blogs in submitting. Um, I also kept up a monthly blog on my website, um, okay. which are, are smaller essays. Um, but really, um, just try to um, write about experiences that somebody else may have with some reflection and what I may have learned from it. And then um, I think I got to a point where I said, OK, I don't want to pigeonhole myself into being a personal essay memoir writer. What's next? Mm -hmm. You know, writers certainly want to just kind of keep going and, and explore what they can where they can go. So my next step really happened organically. Um, I was out at a walk in the woods, which I, I, I go and run or walk. Um, and I came upon a, um, a little bridge, which goes over a branch of the Chicago River. And I must have been in the right place at the right time. I looked over the bridge and the sun was hitting the water and it just exploded in sparkles. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is really cool. It looks like diamonds. So I, I thought about the scene and I thought, oh, that would be cool if there was a little boy in a red cap with a stick and he was poking, you know, the banks down below and his dad was seeing something different. And I walked back home and I just had that scene in my head. And I sat down, I wrote my first short story called When the Sun Kissed the River, submitted it and it was published. So Where that- was it published? Where was it published? Adelaide Literary Magazine. Okay, so in a magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I thought, oh man, okay, now that I kind of get the gist of this, for a while I said, I can't write fiction. I mean, my gosh, you have to make this stuff up, right? Yes, but that was your very first fiction. Like yeah. before that, it was all memoir ish. Okay. Correct. Wow. It was all nonfiction, personal essay. You know, writing what I knew. That moment with the sun, that really yeah. did. Another, you know, it, it was not a coincidence. Wow. Because usually I stay on my path and I thought, oh, yeah. I'm going to veer off and go up this little bridge. It's short. Yeah. That was and, great. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So then what? <laughs> yeah. So awesome. um, I thought, well, let me let me try this fiction thing. So I started writing a book length story, which um, I thought, first I thought of a title. Well, actually I, I had characters. I wanted to write um, a story about women, like four women, three women, whatever the amount was. Um, but women who were so different, who were sisters, but had a common bond uh, of being in the family, of, of a family structure. And, um, I originally had called the book uh, The Fabric of Our Lives, mm. but I realized that people might equate that with the commercial of cotton, and it's not a book about cotton. Yeah. So the, the um, sub-story that is currently in the book 
was the original theme. And in the story, you'll you'll notice that each sister has um, like a textile, a fabric. Uh, Rose mm-hmm. has a you know a, um, a tapestry, and Deborah's got a a tablecloth. Linny's got a cotton rug under her foot feet. Um, and each of those, by the nature of the fabric, represents their personality, is part of their personality. Mm. So that's where the fabric of our lives came through. But I kind of nixed that. I thought, well, but what's the story here? You know, that's kind of nice. So, so when did you when did you have the fabric part before you wrote it? Um, like when you were coming yes. up with it or? OK, yes, pretty wow. much. Yeah. Okay. So you hadn't actually written the story yet. You were just. No, I had my characters. Um, you know, I, I had. Did you take any courses or anything to learn how to do that? Or you just did it? No. No. Wow. No. Because um, they're so developed. I love each sister. You know, they were so. I feel like I knew them. Like I understood them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I wanted to write a book, you know? Yeah. Write them different. Um, but still have family as a common bond. Um, so I and was I Charlotte always, was Charlotte always part of it? Yeah, was she, she was, but she yeah. didn't get her own fabric. No, she didn't. But what she did get was the responsibility by her mom to keep mm-hmm. the secret. Right. And her mom told her go in the attic, get the chest. You know, look in the chest. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a box in there and an envelope with your name on it. And so, how did the mother get the fabric? It, it, I know it, the first one had stored her stuff there. So I got right. that. Yeah. They all kind of ended up storing their okay. stuff. There. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, wow. How did, how did she get these? Yeah. Yeah. They all, you know, I kind of wove that in that, yeah, yeah. you know, um, she got in a box and then there was a scene with, uh, Margaret and Joe in the in the closet and you know what was all in here and mm. um, you know the box and so I tried to kind of make sure that there was like a central point with all that mm. in the box. okay wow yeah. all right so you had the fabric and then where'd you go from there and then um I always um loved a willow tree mm. I thought well I'm just gonna keep this thread going about um trees and um kind of a um, reflection of trees uh, and and a metaphor, a story with metaphor. So I wove in the tree, the wisdom of the willow, as Margaret uh, sits under that tree and gives the base of uh, her teaching and her children's learning underneath that tree and teaches them with wisdom. Mm. And I'm a, a, a big reader and writer of the natural world and how everything is connected. So I wove that in as well. Mm. Margaret's teaching is wisdom of how we are, are all connected within our natural world. The trees talk to each other, um, you know, just a, um, a, a natural, a na- natural organic place to be as we sit among uh, the outside. Wow. I mean, I haven't been under a willow tree probably since I was a kid, but can you really sit under it? They're yeah. Really that big? yeah, you can. Um, there's a scene where um, Joe uh, drags a picnic table under it. And also um, I think a quick scene that he's trimming the branches of the willow so mm. that they don't hit the ground. And then um, I think it is uh, one of the sisters and I forget who, um, sees Joe, the dad, mowing under the willow tree, and then she sees um, little rabbits. It says, "Stop! Oh my gosh!" You know. Um, so yeah, so the willow tree still becomes a, a central figure. And then I and was I, that from was that from your bunny scene with your yes. brother? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah I dropped that, was- that in. First, I didn't know what happened. I had to reread it again to go, oh, he saved him. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I thought he yeah. was yelling at her. I thought yeah. she was like, but no, yeah. she saved no, she the stopped yeah. in front of yeah. wow. the lawnmower and her dad said, stop. Yeah. 
Wow. That was cool. Yeah. Now I see where that came from. So, okay. So then, so you got all that going and then when did you have that before you started writing or did you just start writing? Like, did you I just already... started writing? Yeah. I usually, um, when I write fiction, I start with the characters basically, um, who I think who to me are driver of the story. Um, mm -hmm. because what happens to them what's going on in their lives, their experiences, to me as a driver of the plot. You know, here they are, as is, something happens, they change, and then what is the end? How are they now? So I start with the characters, which I do. I do a, a kind of a sketch. They each have a piece of paper and from everything to physical to personality to, to the what happens. And then from there, I circle around and sketch out my plot the the bigger picture mm. and margaret and joe um and margaret unfortunately develops a um a disease you know has the cancer and um the 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 mother figure that they have looked in on um is is you know it it really becomes a bad situation because they've depended on her for this guidance but yet Margaret in the first paragraph, I think in the prologue says, I really hope I have given my daughters the wisdom of the willow mm. to find their places in life. Now, I thought it was interesting and I don't want to give away the whole book, but can I ask you anyway? Yeah, <laughs> because, of course. Because of course. you know that she's gone because there's a scene, I don't know where it was, somewhere in the middle where she's gone. Like Joe's, you know, just... But then she's alive again. Do you know what I mean? So you know she's going, but you still get to live her. You yes. still get to have her. Do you know exactly. what I mean? What, right. Why did you, what was the um, thinking of that? I still wanted to um, keep her memory um, going throughout the story um, because it was such a, um, a, a big part, a character part of the story. Um, and a driver, um, it started with her. And I wanted to make sure that she and her memory were ended in the story as well. Oh, so was the beginning, maybe I missed that part where you already knew that she was going from the... Yeah, it, it, it was just kind of a flashback, yes. Right, right, yeah. right, okay. Yeah, because I was just kind of like, oh, she's gone and then, oh, but she's back, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, some of the, some of, some of it went back and forth. So that was interesting. Yeah, but yeah it was great. It was, it was very enjoyable and definitely a page turner, you know. Oh, like, thanks. Yeah. I wanted to find out what happened. So, so how did you come up with everything? It just comes like, does it just come to you or like yeah. each character and the marriages and the this and the relationships? Yeah. yeah. You know? I, when I was, um, figuring out my characters, um, I first thought, okay, what, what's relatable here? What, mm. what happens in everyday life? Okay. Um, women get divorced. There's a, a professional woman, uh, Rose, who's an actress, right? And right. she just hides behind all her characters because she doesn't know what she's doing, where she wants to go or who she wants to be. And that could be anybody in any job. Like mm -hmm. they sit and they're thinking, okay, I'm just doing this. I'm going along, but who am I really? And where mm. am I headed? Um, you know, a small shop owner who just loves her job, loves her boss, mm -hmm. you know, cherishes every moment, but yet um, that is, is shattered or cannot happen anymore when her boss, you know, dies and, mm. you know, that whole thing becomes in jeopardy when she thought mm. she knew where she was, you know, and she, she, and she doesn't, you know. Now, would you say some of that, like, were parts of you? Would you say each one had parts of you? Probably personality wise. Yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. Deborah, the, um, you know, no bones about it. She just goes in, in the meetings, um, you know, but she, she loves people. She loves meeting mm. people. Um, you know, let's see, Rose, um, doing a job. Sure. I was, I was in my, you know, working for the bank and mm -hmm. 
I'm like hiding behind this. And I kept saying, I am not a banker. I'm just not a banker, you know, <laughs> nothing against bankers. Or anything, right. But, but no, you're creative. But yeah, not my thing. Okay. And, you know, small business owner, gosh, loving the writing, loving what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, am I, am I really where I'm supposed to be, you know? So yeah, there's a little bit, a little bit of me in each character. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So we're going to take our little commercial break and then we're going to talk some more about the great, the wisdom of the willow by Nancy Chadwick. Yeah. Really great story. Okay. We'll be back after, uh, what is it? A word from our sponsor. Has social-emotional learning become just one more thing on your teacher's plates? Do teachers and students both find it boring and ineffective? Then bring Kikori to your school. Kikori transforms classrooms through experiential SEL activities that help students play, reflect, connect, and grow. Even better, students say it's more fun than recess. Schedule a no-obligation conversation at kikoriapp.com slash bringkikori. K-I-K-O-R-I. Do you ever feel like you can't say what you really want to say? Or that you're stuck or in a holding pattern in your relationships, career, personal life, or finances? Are there things you want in life that you've given up on? Are you resigned that this is as good as it's going to get? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then Hillary Burns, host of the Getting Real with Hillary show, has the solution you need. Hillary is a published author of three books and has a program called The Getting Real Process. This process frees you from what is holding you back, allowing you to create a life you love. Don't believe it? It is hard to believe that it could work, isn't it? The proof is that hundreds of Hillary's clients have used The Getting Real Process and are now free to create whatever they want in relationships, career, finances, enjoying life, or just loving themselves more. So go to realtalkwithhillary.com and order Hillary's book, Real Talk, and set up a conversation. And thank you, as always, to our sponsor, KokoriApp.com. If you want to bring experiential, um, well, no, let me say it again, experiential social emotional learning to your classrooms, to your children, to your businesses, to your teams, check out kukoriapp.com and schedule a time to talk to one of their wonderful employees or owners. And as always, I will, I will what is it, um, shamelessly promote my own books because I can. This was my memoir. It's called The Second Piece of French Toast. You're not allowed to judge me, but it's a very juicy story. You can read it in a day. It's really kind of quick. Um, this one was, is all about speaking up, which I found out that I didn't do when I wrote the first book. Someone, the per- person who read that story said, why didn't you speak up? And I was like, I didn't even know I didn't. So anyway, this is about real talk, learning how to speak up. And uh, you could definitely contact me if you relate to it. Uh, at Hillary at gettingrealwithhillary.com. And then this one is about, it's called Your Bullshit is Your Blessing. And this is about if you find yourself on kind of like the left side of life, that's what I call it, where things don't look so good. This is about tools and techniques that I developed to get back to the right side where things are a lot more fun. So anyway, those are my three books. Love to hear from you. And you can find them all on Amazon. And now we're going to bring back our guest of today, our author, wait, let me say it right, author, writer, essayist, and wife, Nancy Chadwick. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. So where do you want to go from here? You developed your characters. And, I, you know, I guess, you know, for me, it was like I would always be afraid of having to remember the details, like, because you're making it up. You know, when you're writing memoir, it's true. It's your experience. Right. It's your truth. No one can say... We already said that over there or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's your stuff. But when you're writing a book, it's kind of like, how do you keep track of it all? 
Well, um, I am a highly organized indi individual. Okay. Always have been. So when I started writing uh, fiction, book length, The Wisdom of the Willow, mm -hmm. I had um, a notebook and I would start to write basically in a very uh, uh, overview what I wanted the story to mean, what I wanted mm. the story to say. Um, and then it would go in different phases. Then I would go back and I'd essentially rewrite it and I'd plug in, okay, I want it to go from here to here to here, but in between these two points, I want this to happen. So it was a continuous rewriting in my notebook of what I had. And as far as the characters go, which was always the first thing I started with, um, I just basically hand wrote um, out my characters. It's a character sketch. I, I kind of kept the same, what did they look like, personality, what happens to them, um, kind of, you know, as an outline bullet point and filling, filling it in. Um, but at least I always had that. Then I'd have a separate page for setting. Where is this being set? Um, uh, setting, time frame, when does it happen? Um, season, it, what season is it? Wow. Um, so I would get those specifics. But it well, when you're like when you're creating a character, like where does that come from? You just you're just inventing, you're just creating, it just flows. Like you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of observing um, mm. when I'm out in the natural world. That's all I do. Um, it's an opportunity for me to, to, to leave all the noise behind, to sit and to only concentrate on that which my senses are, are pinging, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, what I'm smelling. And it's a very focused, um, almost a meditation kind of a thing, actually. Um, and so when I am out in the world, I transfer those um, practices to where I am. So if I am standing in a grocery line and I'm seeing people in front of me, I will note how they're dressed, how they speak, um, their mannerisms. Are they alone or with somebody? Um, are they young or old? Um, how their posture is. And um, so those details I learned to hone in on and then transfer those to creating characters. Interesting. And do you have to write them down or do you remember them? Like, um, you... Sometimes I do write them down, yeah. But mostly I remember. And I always reason that I remember these details for a reason. Mm. So for instance, you know, a young woman with with blonde hair, but a streak of red coming down. That's something I'll remember. So I might create a character, you know, she may have black hair with a white streak, you know, mm. whatever. But so I just remember the hair or jewelry, a big chunk of jewelry or something. You know, it's not maybe specific, but that, um, you know, she had a big rip in the, in the knee of her jeans. She probably mm. paid three hundred dollars for those jeans for <laughs> to wear with a rip in the knee, you know. <laughs> so that could be a little little thing on the side about this character. She doesn't care, mm. you know, how much money she spends, you know. Um, but she's gonna she's gonna wear some damn nice expensive jeans, even though they look like they just came from a shredder. Now, did were you always were you always observe? Ugh. Were you always observant like that? Or was that just something that you started doing after? I think I always have been um, because I noticed the little bunnies when I was a little kid underneath, mm. you know, in the little nest. Um, and I remember even as a kid at a big snowstorm, I, I would love to venture out and, and I'm a walker, always have been. And I just kind of walk around my house and, you know, put little footprints in the snow. And would just look how the snow is on the trees, mm. you know, listen uh, how quiet it was. Um, so I, I always have been. And, you know, even when I, I was probably got into teenage years, I had a sketchbook and I would just in a, in a charcoal pencil 
and I would just sketch what I saw, literally what I saw. So a lot of trees, um, wow. depending on the sunlight, um, how it was hitting a tree trunk. So whether it was in complete shadow or half of it was lit and then um, the texture of the bark. So mm. um, no, just, just always very observant. So that was natural for you. So, so when you said you wanted to write the mini stories, for when you wanted to get into advertising. Yeah. Would you say you, you're you doing that now? You're doing. Yeah. Shows. Oh, you're, sure. You're doing what you always wanted because sure. you're getting to create. Yeah. You're just not selling with it, but right. you're. I'm still creating you know, characters. Yeah. Um, you know, creating a theme, um, creating yeah. a need, you know, for mm. a consumer, for a, a book buyer. Why would somebody want to read my book? Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm still. Um, you know, with the, the point, making the point of answering those questions. So, and when the person said after your first one, that it was so relatable, is that, I mean, I don't know. I'm just wondering like if what anybody writes is relatable, probably not. It's mm -hmm. probably a gift that you have, but you know, it was relatable, but is that, like when you said, you know, why would someone read it? What would, what would your answer be? Um, I, I think to see, first of all, not only what my experience was, what I, what my circumstances were. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go to, I'll go back to my memoir, like in high school. Um, that's when my parents divorced and, mm -hmm. you know, just felt extremely lost and just, you know, alone maybe. So, mm -hmm. um, going through the experiences um, that I did, it's how I got out of it. So might be an example for somebody else to say, oh, how did she handle that? You know, um, well, maybe I ought to try that kind of thinking, um, you know, just um, to reach out to other people or whatever, ho however I handled the experience. Um, now, did you, because I know when I wrote mine, I wanted to, you know, it was about a time in my life when I felt stuck. I was in my marriage and I didn't know how the hell I'd gotten here. And I felt that because I had gone out of it, you know, even though, you know, maybe I don't look so good because of the things I did in it, but I wanted to write it in case someone else had gone through that. Sure, sure. But, but then sometimes I would have the thought, and I don't know if you did, like, who wants to read about me? You know what I mean? Like, why do, why, you know, it's like that negative side to like that I talked about in this book. Yeah. It's stuck yeah. over there going, nobody wants to read what you wrote. Are you kidding me? You know, and it's that negative, that sure. negative brain. Oh, yeah. Oh, Did yeah. Did you ever have those thoughts? Um, most oh. through the whole memoir. Yeah. Oh. And I was writing all okay. the different, you know, and the critiques would come back. And, and I was trying to find what that thread is um, that would really want people to read this because it was so unconventional. Um, a single- but Are you talking husband. about the first one or the second? Yes, the first one. The first one, okay. Yeah, it was very unconventional. I, I, I wasn't writing about a single thing that happened to me. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, nothing really tragic happened. Mm -hmm. um, but when I would go back um, and write that, I need to um, write it in a way that um, a reader will have a takeaway. Um, and I would, I, I would write of the reflection and then I would say, well, maybe this is what I should have done or um, mm -hmm. this is what I have done. And because of this, it made me you know, a stronger person and maybe in the future so it, it 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 kind of lends itself to when a reader reads that they get thinking and 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 will think well okay she did this maybe i should try that too mm. now when you say nothing tragic happened i mean i would think to a child a divorce could i mean it's not tragic someone dies but that's right, pretty right. life changing all of right. a sudden you know, you don't have the same home and your parents are in different sure. places and where do you belong and what if they find new people? You know, yeah. I would think that would, and I'm sure a lot of people have gone through it. So I'm sure that was very helpful. Yeah. yeah. And when I say tragic, I mean, as opposed to other memoirs out there are, um, 
you know, like alcoholism or, you know, just a yeah. horrible, tragic physical accident or right. drug addiction. Abuse. Abuse. Horrible yeah. things. Yeah. 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 Well, that's cool. So, and was it hard for you to come up with those, those things? Like maybe I should have done this or maybe, or that was just part of your reflection always. Um, yeah, no, it wasn't, but yes, it was difficult because I did a lot of editing. I had to pull out so much stuff that had nothing mm. to do, um, with what I was saying, you know, with the, with the connection. So I had to find that theme. Um, and it took me, oh gosh, 15 years, you know, by the time I, I first wrote it, um, I wrote, you know, versions, I put it in a drawer for, I don't know, two, three years, took it back out. And then I would send it out for critiques. So probably three, four different critiques, come back, revise. The, you know, so I was in no hurry. I, I certainly knew this was going to be a work in, in progress here for sure. Um, and and was that when you were married, part of the 27 yes. years where you weren't working at your job? Correct. That was all I was working on. And, and you know, I was doing um, the personal essays on my blog, just kind of you know, side things, but the memoir was it. So did you ever think like when you put it in the drawer for two to three years, cause I'm sure a lot of people have done that. Um, did you ever think you would take it out um, or did you just say I've had it enough? You know, at like, the time what I was did, thinking? Yeah. yeah. At the time I did, I said, I've had it. This is going nowhere. <laughs> who the hell wants to read this about a tree? <laughs> and you know, it's somebody who had all these experiences, right? Um, what, what makes this hoop to do? So, um, and I'd let it percolate, you know, mm -hmm. I just kept thinking, thinking about it. And then eventually I pulled it out and I said, damn, I have been through years of working on this. I'm not going to let this go. I'm mm. going to see this through to the end. And so I just kept going and going and plugging. Yeah. Wow. And then when it was finally published, what did you say? Um, yeah, it was, um, well, it, and also it, it was what my mother said with, you know, her wide mouth wide open. I mean, she was, yeah, she was a little upset. Um, but, um, you know, uh, God rest her soul. Um, I said, you know, mom, as I tried to have a heart to heart, um, this book really is not about you. I, I, and I, I don't, didn't mend this for you to, to feel, you know, in a, in a very bad place, but this is all, of, this was me. This is about what happened to me and what I went through and so forth. And I said, but mom, how's the writing? How did you like the writing? Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful writing. She said, just beautiful writing. So at least did I got never... there, right? Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Did, did, um, did she ever get over it? Um, I think she did. Yeah, yeah, I think she did. I don't think she forgot, but I think she moved on. When, when I wrote my, well, I did change the name of my ex, um, but he, I, and I, and I let him read it ahead mm -hmm. of time, but I, I changed the name, but still I was going to change my name, but then I just, you know, I asked lawyers and stuff oh, and they good. said, you know, if it's your truth, if it's my truth, yes. it's my story to write. And yes. Yeah, so I changed his name. I changed a couple of other people who might have been incriminated yeah. as well. Absolutely. But but the one thing when he read it, you know, he didn't say nice. Right? He just said, take out this one thing where he was sitting on the couch drinking a beer. Oh, OK. That was it. Okay. Of all the other stuff he left in. And I was like, all right. Yeah. So, but yeah, so I was shocked. Yeah. Right? Yep. Oh yeah. Later on, he's like, I really don't like that book, but he never commented on the writing or anything. It was really just how yeah. he, how it was about him. So oh, it's nice though. Yes. Well, it's like when you see a picture, right? Where do you go? You go to look at yourself, right? You sure. don't go to look. At sure. Exactly. Right. You right. don't care how they look. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's interesting about your mother. What, what was other people's reactions? Um, they liked it. And, and that was it. family, yeah. you know, just yeah. a few family members. I, you know, had read it, but, um, friends that I'd grown up with, oh my gosh, they, they liked it. They just thought it was mm. great. And, 
uh, the writing, you know, um, the prose. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was very positive. So okay. I, Good. I was okay. I was yeah. okay. Now is this new one out? And I just have to tell you, I, there were some, there were some pages down and some comments and this was your copy. I don't know if you knew if you were looking for it. It had like some corrections in it. Oh, okay. That's okay. Not a problem because it, it the book was released May 7. Okay. All right. So it's out. So you don't it need to out. go back. It is so out. At first I was like, well, how did that page get turned down? And then I saw a couple of, you know, circles, you know, where, with comments and stuff. And I was like, uh oh, I hope you're not. Oh, I hope no. You know no. I have this and you're not. You know, I, yeah. Yeah. Like, like you would check something off here, you know. So I was like, oh, oh gosh. Yeah. I probably pulled it when I was doing um, some edits or something or, and I apologize. You didn't get a clean copy. No, no, no. It's fine. I was just afraid. And I kept forgetting to tell you that oh, I no. hope you weren't looking for it. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, changes. no. Yeah, no so I, I had just a few left. And yeah. um, so it must've gotten in the, in the, the stack. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. It was perfect. But I just, I was kind of like, Oh, this is, this is a really cool copy because yeah, you were it is a cool it. copy. Yeah. 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 I just want to make sure you knew and that you weren't missing it. So the yeah. book, okay. So the book, so this book, wisdom of the willows was mm -hmm. released May 7th. Correct. Yes. Okay. And then where can people find it? You can find it on Amazon bookshop.org okay. Barnes and Noble. Um, yeah, it is, it is uh, widely distributed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's by Nancy Chadwick. Uh -huh. And then um, what would you say, like if this book could have a long lasting effect and you could impact the world with this book or just with your writing in general, what kind of impact would you like to have on the world? I think um, that's a good question. I think, and, and I don't mean to sound really preachy, but because our natural world is kind of slipping from us in, in mm -hmm. every way. Um, I think um, we owe it to ourselves to go out into the natural world, to sit, to appreciate it, uh, to listen uh, to it, to um, find, um, find ourselves. And I know that sounds cliche, but um, to really look inside ourselves and where we're meant to be and where we're meant to go. And that is not meant to be looked at as any lofty goal that, you know, may be out of our reach, but something that is small, you know, something very, um, very insignificant to others, but maybe significant to you. And I started writing uh, probably less than a year ago on Substack and I called my Substack. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Substack. Mm -mm. Um, it is a writing platform that is is become very popular with writers. Mm. Um, so um, I do write on there as often as I can. Um, but I called it "Finding the Simple in a Complicated World," and mm. because our our world now is so complicated, and we have gotten so caught up into it and sometimes find ourselves being not ourselves. We get caught up in, in all the vitriol and the anger and, and we're just tired, um, that we owe it to ourselves to go out into the natural world, to decompress, to just let it all go, and to um, just kind of try to renew ourselves and find out where we're supposed to be. Hmm. And when you say natural world, you just mean going outside? outside a park. Um, you know, walking through the woods, somewhere where there is um, less people and cars and activity and more green space, growing things. Mm. Wow. And it seems like you've always gravitated towards trees. Like, I, I, yes, I think like I have. woods and trees, because I love the water. I live by the water and I, yeah. that's my natural space, but I never thought of it as like a thing. I know I get more relaxed. I know yes. I can find oh, sure. peace if I take a walk. Right. You know, I go out yeah. and then I come back like, oh, it's a wonderful world. Yeah. You know, somehow it, all that evaporates. I don't know why, but there's yeah. something about nature. Yeah. Where did you first find nature? Like, um, oh gosh. Um, I think I've always liked parks, going to parks, yeah. um, you know, but not, 
not a real uh, swing set kind of activity park, but out, mm -hmm. you know, maybe set aside um, where I would sit and kind of observe what was in front of me, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving uh, to the house where I am now, um, there's um, five minutes away from uh, a forest preserve and a bike path and and that goes that stretches north and south and I can take my bike all the way to the Chicago Botanic Garden, which um, is, is very near me, um, which I go and, and walk and just mm. find a nice quiet spot. And yeah, so I'm very lucky and grateful. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for that. So sit and appreciate listen i like what you said before about the senses yes smell see maybe touch he listen, listen. yes uh, absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. In, i think in our normal uh, everyday life we are so bombarded and it's just information overload that everything shuts down really and yeah. it kind of make you nuts and crazy and angry and act out but yeah you know, you removing yourself from that to a, a natural space um, that uh, where you can tune that out. And then it, it really takes practice, really, um, to know, to concentrate on doing that, to leaving mm. your thoughts out there and shifting your thoughts to where you are in the present moment. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Take thank a deep you. breath. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for everything. We're out of time, but I just want to thank Nancy Chadwick and her book, The Wisdom of the Willow. And thank you so much for, for what you're doing for the world. It's beautiful. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Great conversation. Thank you. Yes, I enjoyed it. Bye. Thank you for watching this episode. I started getting real with Hillary when I discovered that I was a people-pleasing pleasant phony and wanted to be more of my real self. We can grow together if you will like the show, subscribe to my channel, and share this episode with your friends and family so that we can have a world that's more real.